Thank you. I'd like to welcome every single one of you, really, really from my heart, for coming to this public symposium. I know that people have traveled literally from around the world to participate in this three-day session. And that's important to all of us. And I think that you're going to see over the next three days, you have a rare opportunity to look towards the future in terms of inspiring people to tackle really, really hard problems. So I'm Dave Nayland. And I'm the originator of this, this study, the 100-Year Starship Study. Uh, this is a one-year study that we created to go look at the challenges of doing research for the future. I'm going to spend a few minutes today talking about why we did that. There's an old Japanese proverb that we paraphrased here that says that vision without execution is daydreaming. And I want you to think about this for the next three days. It's not enough to have a good idea. Good ideas have to become reality through people working hard on individual challenges and problems to build technologies to go solve those challenges and ultimately accomplish that vision. And what we're trying to inspire with the 100-Year Starship Study is that first step in establishing a bar that's high enough with challenges that are hard enough that people will actually go start tackling some of these really hard problems. Now, there are naysayers out there that have said from the, from the very first day of, why is this relevant to the Department of Defense? Why is DARPA doing this? This is a NASA role. I absolutely will agree with you. NASA is the space business for the US. But at every step along the way in the space business, the Department of Defense has benefited from the products and the technologies that have been developed and are used directly in DOD missions and by DOD service members. And I want to give you a couple examples of that to show the relevance of why we are in the process of steering this. It may be possible that, that there are folks here in the audience that don't realize that DARPA was actually founded as tackling space problems. DARPA was founded directly as a result of the Sputnik launch in 1957, and President Eisenhower stood up DARPA in 1958 and said, I want to have a place that thinks outside the box, identifies hard problems, and moves towards the future in tackling those challenges. And space was the first arena. So there's a sort of poetic license with DARPA thinking about these kinds of problems anyway. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the statement of, of vision is, is without execution is daydreaming, you can look back across several historical examples. In the, in the realm of flight is a very prime one. Think about the fact that Leonardo da Vinci actually originally conceived of flying manned flight more than 500 years ago. But it was only in 1903 that we had the first manned powered flight. But even when Orville and Wilbur Wright conceived of and built a manned flying machine, even they couldn't have postulated the technology path that would have led us all the way to a Mach 3 uh, supersonic aircraft for the military in the early 60s. It was teams of people that took that vision of applying technologies and applying it in different domains. Domains like the first real use of aircraft was for commercial air mail. But that was developed and along the way ultimately became capabilities of being jet airliners that almost everybody here flew on a jet airliner which came out of that vision of flight ultimately through these teams developing technology. So there's a process there. It's not enough to have a good idea. You got to take, inspire the people to get the education, to work hard on problems, to do incremental and grand challenge steps to build, building the ultimate technologies. In the space flight arena, think about the fact that Jules Verne wrote From Earth to the Moon in 1865. We were fighting the Civil War here. We had guys riding horses across fields and shooting each other with, with, you know, with uh, rifles and cannons, and Jules Verne wrote about sending men to the moon, yet he had no way of actually envisioning how you would actually do that. In fact, he actually got it wrong. He got the physics, physics of it wrong. He got the technological approach wrong. He said we were going to launch people out of a cannon, which would have been basically a 30,000 G launch, which would have crushed everybody to two-dimensional figures when they got out of the end of the barrel. But the fact is that he inspired generations five generations, 
to build the technologies that allowed us to go to the moon in the 60s. Now that's where 100 year starship, the, the, the whole notion of 100 years comes about. Five generations. We know the problem domain that's out there. When we say we want to go to do space flight, we don't know the problems, the challenges, and the technologies to get there. But back to the DOD. Why is this relevant to the DOD? That very inspiration that led us to the moon and that had Arthur Clarke write about communication satellites in the 40s was of direct payoff to the Department of Defense and communication satellites, GPS, and the other technologies that we use and take for granted today in the Department of Defense using space. I'm not going to belabor a lot of others, but I want you to think about, as you go through this next three days, there are real challenges in front of the DOD. Sustenance, you know, basic food supplies. You know, we have the incredible agricultural machines today, but did you know that we literally send millions millions of MREs, little packaged food stuff, to our troops in the field overseas. Is there a better way? Well, if you solve the problem for long duration, long distance space flight for food supplies, what could you do in terms of the Department of Defense for forward operating locations? The same is true with energy. Did you know that today the typical soldier carries 45 pounds of batteries in his backpack when he goes into the field to operate his GPS and his radio, his night vision goggles, you know, all the myriad of, of really incredible technologies we give to the soldier. <clears throat> Every single one of those needs a different type of battery. And you add those pounds into his backpack, and then those batteries are disposable or not rechargeable. We've got to solve that problem. You solve the energy problem for space flight, regenerative power, self-sustaining power, we can use it in the Department of Defense. And think about biology and medicine, remote operations. Well, the same problem. If you're on a space flight, long duration, long distance space flight, you can't stop off at the local drugstore to get antibiotics. What do you do in, that, in those kinds of situations? You solve that problem there, we can take advantage of that in the Department of Defense. Now, there's a lot of places and a lot of examples right now today where the Department of Defense has directly taken the technologies out of space, technology, space developments and used them. And, and here are a few examples, robotics, microelectronics, composite technologies, the, the uh, diagnostic equipment for jet engines, and it goes on even further. Water purification systems, you know, flame resistant materials for flight suits and for soldiers, for soldiers' clothes, the MREs that I mentioned. Things like helmets, you know, the new materials for helmet technology. And, and frankly, when you go to Home Depot and you're able to go buy a cordless drill, did you realize that that was actually developed by the technologies behind it were developed for the space missions in the 60s to allow to have astronauts in space have electric cordless tools. We take it for granted today when we go down and buy one. So all of these things are directly applicable to the Department of Defense. So when we envisioned this and we created this study and this symposium, it was with self-interest for the Department of Defense and for NASA. Get some of the best brains in the world thinking about it, getting them organized, getting them thinking about the future and attacking these problems, but at the same time with the offshoots of those technology developments being of benefit both to the Department of Defense and to NASA. So I'm going to get off the stage here in a second. I want to, I want to say a couple things. Um, Pete Warden is coming up after me. Pete's my co-conspirator, if you will, in terms of putting this study together. As I say, this is a one-year study and we're closing in on the end of this study. And we're very satisfied with the input and the intellectual content that we've gotten going forward. And Pete's going to say a few words about that. And then we have a real honor after that. Ms. Ariel Waldman is going to come up and give us a keynote address. And I've asked her here specifically for one reason. We need to change the way we think about space. We need to think forward to a different group and a different mindset in terms of how we tackle space challenges. And I think Ariel's got a really interesting presentation for you today that leads you in that direction. So get to know your track chairs. We have seven of them. They are fabulous. They've done an incredible job of getting good papers and good content. It's a really aggressive schedule, and I've already taken too much time this morning. You're going to have a hard time choosing which one of these sessions you want to sit in, because there are so many incredibly good presentations that are going to be made over the next three days. <clears throat> 